This video is brought to you by Skillshare. With so many by-elections taking place lately, many of us have been wondering what they can tell us about the upcoming general election. Now, of course, they do give us an indication about the current state of play, but ultimately, there's only so much we can take from them. Right now, we don't even know when this election is going to take place, with the decision resting solely with the Prime Minister. All we do know is that the latest date he can legally call the election is January 2025. So, with by-election defeats coming in thick and fast, with the cost of living crisis still hurting families up and down the country, and with the Tories still more than 20 points behind in the polls, it's worth asking exactly when the Prime Minister is actually going to call this election. Is there a time that would actually benefit him and his party, or are the Tories doomed no matter when the election's called? Let's have a look. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Now, it's worth starting this video by briefly explaining the mechanisms behind the calling of a general election. Back in 2011, the Lib Dem Tory coalition passed the Fixed Term Parliament Act, or FTPA, which took the power away from the Prime Minister to call an election. Instead, unsurprisingly, it fixed the date of each subsequent election at five years after the previous one. In both 2017 and 2019, the government found ways to get around this, and decided last year to ditch the FTPA altogether. So, we're back to a situation where the Prime Minister can effectively decide when the election is. Now, the Prime Minister does technically need to receive permission from the monarch in order to dissolve Parliament, which would in turn trigger a general election. You're joking. Not another one? However, it would be unprecedented for the monarch to deny such a request. The very last date that Sunak could make such a request is the 17th of December 2024, which is exactly five years since the 2019 general election. The election would then take place 25 working days later. This takes us to the 28th of January 2025. Now, interestingly, most governments in the last 40 years have actually waited until the very last moment for the election. Now, as we've already outlined, the government is not exactly in a great position right now. As such, it would be reasonable to expect that Sunak is going to wait it out and hold the election at the last moment. However, most in the Westminster bubble think that this isn't going to happen for a couple of reasons. First, it would look weak for Sunak to hold out that long. To wait until the very last moment will gift the opposition the charge of cowardice in the campaign period. Second, it would back Sunak into a corner. Holding out removes all autonomy from Sunak. At least if he penciled in a May election, he could delay it until November if the polling didn't look to be improving. So it's probable that Sunak will call the election before he's forced into one in December. Now, the obvious question is, when is the most likely time for the election to be called? There are effectively two periods in which people suggest an election could take place. May and November. People that argue over which is more likely generally do so by debating two things. Which of these months will see Sunak hit more of his five pledges, and which of these months will see him in the strongest position with his party? Now, it's fair to say that the biggest policy priority for Sunak and the public is the economy. Indeed, three of Sunak's five priorities relate to the economy. Reducing inflation, growing the economy, and reducing debt. Now, according to research by the Institute for Government, or IFG, the inflationary target is set to be reached by the end of 2023, with it falling further in 2024, reaching a low of almost 2% by the beginning of 2025. So, in essence, the longer Sunak waits, the better the situation becomes. The same is true of GDP. GDP is expected to rise back to about 0.8% above the Q4 2022 levels by the end of 2023, but will rise to 1% by the beginning of 2025. So, the takeaway here is that the longer Sunak leaves it, the better the economic situation is likely going to be for him. The same is true of another of his five pledges, the NHS waiting list. He pledged to reduce the waiting list. The IFG has predicted that it will not begin to fall properly until June next year, which adds weight to the argument that Sunak may well hold off for a November election, as Sunak certainly won't want to hold an election while the waiting list is still at a high. And on the final of his pledges, stopping the boats, it seems that the July to October time is the worst for the small boat arrivals in the UK. 
This doesn't really add weight to either of the May or November argument, as the number of arrivals are expected to be similar in both months. So it does seem that November would be better for Sunak on both the economic side and the NHS side of things, but there are also other factors at play, not least the impact on the actual parties themselves. Now, November is usually the time when conference season starts. This is a big source of revenue for both parties, and holding an election around here would mean cancelling the conference season, denying both the Tories and Labour a chance to build up their war chests. Now, this in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that a November election won't happen, but it will be something that Sunak factors in. And considering the state of the Tory finances at the moment, it could well be something that factors quite significantly into Sunak's decision. Ultimately though, no one actually knows when the election is going to be called. Sunak himself might have an idea, but anything could happen in the next year that could affect this decision. His main motivation will be choosing a time that best suits the Conservatives, and while we can speculate and try and guess now when this time might be, there is no way of knowing for sure without knowing what's to come in the months ahead. A few weeks ago we told you that we were making a physical newspaper, but it turns out that designing a newspaper isn't all that easy. So we headed to Skillshare to take their course on the topic. Unlike when Jack tried to learn InDesign for another never released project a few years ago, this time he was guided through the process quickly and efficiently, and this time the project will actually see the light of day thanks to Skillshare's incredibly easy to follow guides. In fact, here's an exclusive little preview of what we've been working on. It's not just that either, you likely already knew Skillshare for classes and things like photography, editing and illustration, but did you know that Skillshare also has hundreds of career focused classes too? That's courses on everything from how to start a business to maximising your workflow or how to grow in e-commerce, another course that Jack's taking to help him with the newspaper. And if you use our link, then you can get access to all of that for free. That's right, the first 500 people to use our link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers. 30 days free and 40% off your first year of Skillshare membership. That's the best Skillshare offer we've ever had, so make sure you click our link in the description. Thanks for your support and to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.